So my name is Vic Bishop. I'm the legislative chair of the Eastside Transportation Association. And we're here at our monthly meeting uh, to discuss uh, transportation issues on the east side. And we have as our guest this morning, uh, Kemper Freeman, who is the chair and CEO of uh, uh, Kemper Development Company and, and the, uh, I don't know, what do you call yourself? The president or CEO of the Bellevue Collection? I'm the one that gets to pay the debt. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Kemper told me a decade or more ago that uh, he, on an average day, he has like 60,000 people show up at his properties and on a busy day in December, he doubled that. It's more like 120,000. So he has a, a fairly keen interest in how people get in and around and through Bellevue and to the Kemper uh, development properties, which of course are a mile away from the freeway from 405 through downtown Bellevue. So it's been a, uh, I don't know, three generational problem or issue that the Kempers had to deal with. Yep. And, and uh, probably there's nobody around that's got a bigger interest, personal interest in having things work right than uh, Kemper Freeman at, at, at Katie's. So Kemper, why don't you introduce uh, the subject and why you're interested in this? Okay, well, thank you, Vic. Uh, I, I've got a strong interest in this. Years ago, when we, d we do our company at uh, Bellevue Square and, and uh, the Bellevue Collection uh, does tracking research every year to ask our customers what do they like or what do they not like about our, our business, our company. In a year's time, we see now about 30 million customers come and go from our property, either walking or on transit or in car usually uh, two, three people to a car, uh, going to a shopping center may be the best use of the family car there ever was because uh, people go usually an average of two to three to a car and, uh, and they can uh, cover four to five shopping uh, trips a piece, all with one trip in a car. So it's probably the best use of an American automobile that there ever was. And, uh, but 30 million a year, that's second in the Northwest only to the airport. So the airport is more than that, and it's the eighth largest airport in the United States. So we would, when, you, when you're growing a company and your customers are saying, we'd love you, but we would come more often if we could get there, but we can't get there anymore, so we come with less. That, that's turned up the throttle on my interest in transportation, and it was making me sick to to see uh, uh, government talking about uh, the brutality of even working on this subject because it can't be solved. And an example that made me particularly sick uh, was just last summer when all 50 DOT directors, director of uh, transportation uh, of 50 states all met in Spokane for their annual meeting. And our director stood up and welcomed them all to Spokane in the state of Washington and said, uh, congestion is here to stay. There's nothing we can do about it. Uh, get over it. That was his opening sentence after he said hello. That's how he, he led. The, and that, that is what too many people in government believe is uh, all there is to it. It can't be fixed. So it's too bad. Uh, I just refuse. I've refused all my life to accept all the things that can't be done. And I've been able to do a lot of things that I didn't think I could do because I've stayed on it until I figured out how to do it. And one of the things I did then was to call Bill Eager, who we'd done some work with. I'd known him. He lived in Bellevue. His company was TDA. Uh, he had worked all, all over the world and throughout the United States. He was on the executive committee of the ULI in, uh, in Washington, D.C., and one of their most respected transportation experts. He did uh, significant work in Dubai, a uh, 13-hour flight from here. I think he's got more air miles than fly over one day in a week and be there for a while and come back and, and probably more air miles and do that every week for a while and more air miles than he can use up the rest of his life. But um, I, I went to him first and said, for my own mental health, I just need to know, is, there a, can, is it solvable? So he did some studies and came back to me and he said, absolutely, it's solvable. This thing uh, is, 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 it can be solved. Uh, we can't afford not to solve it. 
uh, and, but our government has become quite uh, paranoid on thinking that it's solvable and, and has a whole completely different agenda and seem to be perfectly happy with this thing not being solved. So Bill Eager and I went together and did a formal study uh, to see what, what uh, could and should be done. And we didn't do it just for Bellevue Square and our business. We did it for the same way that the region plans uh, transportation. It's a four county region of metropolitan Seattle. Seattle is uh, the major city in the four counties. And, uh, and, and unfortunately for us, uh, all of the headquarters for major transportation institutions are in Seattle. The PSRC is in Seattle, Metro's in Seattle, Sound Transit's in Seattle and Seattle has the most legislators in Olympia, so they have access to Olympia for the statewide, and uh, the east side isn't uh, in, in a significant place uh, in that lineup to, uh, and Seattle has all my life worried 99% about solving their problems and not anybody else's, and uh, in fact, they just soon the east side would have gone away. Uh, but we didn't go away and it's become very successful and so what, what, uh, what we've done here is uh, I've asked Bill to put together a team of experts that he's met in his career to do a, a Mobility 21 study. Uh, in the hour or so we have today, we'll be able to give you the highlights and I think get you excited about the fact that we're really on to the solutions and, and it, is, uh, it is a solvable problem and uh, this plan is a good roadmap to, to figure out uh, how to do it. When, when we're done with this meeting, um, Vic, I don't know how you want to do this, but if, if people want to contact you and, or, 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 or just get to us their email address, we will email everybody a copy of the study. And I would- well, If there's a link uh, that could be link. put up, then maybe Barb could put that in the chat and yeah. people could read it in the chat. Okay, that, that'd be good if that's possible to, uh, to, to get that so that we can uh, so we'll have to set something up. We'll, we'll set something up. She's, if I could just get a note of who's all here, we'll figure out a way to contact yeah. them. But and then I'd like to have everybody have a copy and then in two to four weeks have a, have a return bout where we, now that all of us are familiar with the ideas and have read the report and can see what uh, the excitement's all about and be excited like we are that this is solvable and it's affordable. Uh, we, we get together and answer questions, uh, any questions you guys might have. I mean, a lot of you are professional transportation experts, so it's like a busman's holiday for all you guys. But uh, so let, let me go on a little bit. The, uh, the, 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 uh, Bill, Bill Eager created the study. Uh, a lot of you and members uh, that you know are on that committee. All of that's in the report that uh, I'll get for you. Um, one, one of, uh, I'd like to just make a couple of comments on some things that are in the study that are very exciting and uh, then turn it over to, uh, to Bill to make some comments and then he'll introduce Chuck Collins to make some comments. And Chuck Collins was the head of Metro Transit which today is uh, uh, maybe the seventh, uh, one, of, one of the top transit uh, uh, machines in the, in the United States. And, um, and Chuck was the founder of that and did an amazing thing and is, is an amazing person. And uh, I'll share with you something he shared with us and, and what that led to is that when he was in the middle of creating the bus system in Seattle, uh, a gentleman uh, called on him and, and he met in his office and had this idea about uh, 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 van pools. And uh, in about 10 minutes, uh, Chuck listened to the speech about van pools and said, my God, this guy's got an idea that uh, is better than anything I'm doing at Metro. And uh, I don't need to have my attention diverted. This, is a, this could be a real competitor it's a lot less expensive and, and could be way more effective. And so he asked the guy to leave before he was done with his presentation. Two weeks later, he called him back and he said, I, I can't uh, treat you that way. You, you've got a terrific idea and we need to hear it. And uh, ever since that point, uh, he's been wanting to uh, 
uh, do a van pool study. He likes to call it a taxi pool instead of a van pool, but but uh, I'll let him tell that story. That that is amazing. What can be done? How efficient it is, and and kind of uh, ideas that we can get going. Um, this this uh, study has been going on for uh, a great period of, period of time, and. Uh, what we I'll just give you an outline of it. It is the it it is solvable. It is solvable over the next several years. And this study, if we, if we adopt it and if it goes forward, which it should, it can reduce delays by forty percent. It can accommodate thirty percent increase in daily personal trips. It can increase a, a reduction in in costs that are already expected, the, the expenditures that are, are already in the works, it can reduce the expected costs that we're spending now by 30% and, and make a huge difference in, uh, in, in making transportation work. There's uh, always some outstanding news besides the Van Pool idea. Uh, there's another one I'm just gonna touch on. Uh, it's called ADAS. It is Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. And I think this is the first time that uh, any, any professional study has been done on that in the Northwest when, when Bill had this, uh, did this. It will provide by itself with just the uh, high-tech advances that are coming to the automobile. One, two, three of those things occur every year. Uh, when enough cars have these things, we don't. These are the things that ultimately will lead to self-driving cars. But long before we have self-driving cars, just the addition of ADAS systems on existing cars, and this is uh, everything from the from the little warning system when you're on the freeway and you're you're trying to turn into the left lane or the right lane that you get a warning that there's a car in your blind spot and don't 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 turn in there. Another ADAS is the advanced uh, looking forward uh, radar system that checks the cars around you and makes sure that you're, uh, if, the, if you're going 70 and the car in front of you is going 60, that it slows you down to the same speed of the car in front of you. That system has been around on several cars for a long time, and several makes. But the collection of advanced um, systems will by itself provide up to 50% more trip capacity on the entire uh, greater Seattle four counties. Uh, and if you 50, and that's a, a, and those are basically cars that are on the freeway. Free, the freeway is 25% uh, of all trips. So if, uh, if 50% of those are, are with ADS in the next few years, it would provide a 25% uh, decrease in trip congestion all by itself at virtually no cost to the government. And then an extra thing I would say that you all know is the uh, Uber and Lyft in Seattle now for more than a year, the two, those two firms that are totally privately financed, not publicly financed, uh, are now moving more trips within the city of Seattle than all, all transit in Seattle combined. So there, there are huge breakthroughs. The government doesn't uh, do anything to make these things happen. They, they sort of like uh, everybody just riding a public transit vehicle somewhere. The public would prefer the freedom of going where they want, when they want, how they want. And if transit can be the answer, go on the answer. And if, uh, if it isn't, let them have their own system to go and all this. So this, this whole system saves billions of dollars reduces congestion more than any other plan in the Northwest and uh, is, is really um, something that we can do and start working on right away. So I'd like to introduce uh, Bill Eager, who you already know real well, but Bill, if I can, he's the luckiest one of us all. He, I keep him working and he keeps working, but he's up in Friday Harbor in the sunshine. So that's my favorite place to go and he gets to live there. So Bill, I stay with us long enough to get us through this mess and then take all the time off you want. Go ahead, Bill. We have the same fog up here that looks like you'd have on Lake Washington. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> stay close. Stay close. 
Okay. Um, at the risk of repeating a little bit, we think it's important to identify the problem that you're trying to solve. And we have some, some strong suspicions that programs like the light rail program started with a solution and not with an identification of what the problem was to be solved. Now I'm gonna go through these one at a time so I won't talk about them here. Um, I, I don't think I need to say much to you people about congestion is bad and getting worse. Uh, we know that it, it's shown in all kinds of surveys, federal and INRICS and uh, PSRC. And unfortunately, the adopted regional transportation plan doesn't make it better. It makes it worse by, by about 10% and delay per trip by 2040. So that's going in the wrong direction. The uh, investments we're making are out of balance. If you look at the chart on the left, that's the investment in the adopted regional plan between 2018 and 2040. And in yellow, it shows local transit and sound transit. So it's it, those two together are 50%, 56% of all the investments we're gonna make in travel, capital and operating and maintenance between now and 2040, 56% uh, of all the money. And yet, if you look over here in the yellow, sound transit and local transit constitute only about 4% of the market. And, and uh, sound transit where the, more than half of the money is going is only about 2%. Government is, as Kemper mentioned, the uh, government's not doing much. The Secretary of Transportation says it's not possible to reduce congestion. We would agree that we can't totally eliminate congestion. That's just built into human nature, but we can certainly make it a lot better. Um, and the DOT is building express toll lanes, which raise a few dollars for them, but uh, reduces capacity. So it's, it's a step in the wrong direction. Sound Transit would spend more than 65 billion to boost their market share, the transit market share by about 1%. And PSRC decade after decade keeps advocating transit, higher density land use, pedestrians and in bikes. But if you look at the decades of history, they've had little effect. This shows an illustration of how Seattle dominates transportation issues. That's why they strongly voted for the light rail. Here's what light rail looks like in the year 2040, the projected trips. Notice how they're concentrated in the city of Seattle and north and how few that are on the east side and how few are cross leg, which, which agrees with what they had promised, uh, even though they didn't try to publicize that. It, it costs are exceedingly high. It, it's, it's terrible. For example, here between 2018 and 2040 for transit, it shows the total cost per ride is over $20. Now, let me explain what that is. That's the total capital and operating and maintenance expenses between 2018 and 2040 to provide that transit system divided by the total ridership between 2018 and 2040. So if you look at the calculations, you'd see the cost is about $111 billion divided by about 5.5 billion total person trips. So that's tw over 20 bucks. The adopted highway programs only about 29 cents. 
it's not that highways are inexpensive, they are expensive too, but the ridership, the use is so much higher. And of course, pedestrians and bikes are a real bargain, but they don't do everything either. Uh, well, Mobility 21, and you've had kind of a hint at that. It's, it's an alternative to the regional transportation plans funded by Kemper Development. And, it, and, and we're trying to restore the public's long established freedom to travel when, where, and how they want. And Kemper already mentioned this, we can serve the projected 30% increase in daily person trips. Um, we can cut the delay per trip by 40%. A lot of that's due to the ADAS, uh, the Advanced Driver Assistance System. And we can cut regional plan costs by 30%. And a large part of that is because this plan would stop construction of light rail beyond that that's already received federal approval or is under construction. Um, in addition to the ADAS, that's the first bullet here, we do in the program add some freeway and arterial lanes um, in selected locations and fund those with flat rate, flat rate, flat rate low cost tolls. It converts um, HOV and HOT lanes to general purpose lanes. Uh, which have greater capacity than the HOT and HOV lanes. Um, it stops addition to light rail and commuter rail, big buses and multiple transfers, and incorporates 21st century transit technologies. And Chuck Collins will talk a little about one example of that. Here's a comparison of the cost per trip. You, you might recall previously you saw the $20.20 for the adopted regional tra transportation plan. We can cut that to about a third, $8 with the, with the M21 plan. And for highways, that's for transit and for highways and pedestrians and bikes, it doesn't make that much difference because it's already a bargain. That's it. Um, Chuck, are you available? Chuck Collins? I know he was going to be a, a little bit late. Um, so, uh, uh, Bill, we did have one question that maybe you could address a little bit. Did, uh, uh, could you put your map back up on the, on the green lines? Uh, we've got a question about that map. Okay. Uh, and the question is, is that true? Is that really right? That Sound Transit projected almost zero uh, trips across the lake? I mean, we do have East Lake. It's got... This, these are, this is one of those charts where the uh, line gets uh, wider if there's more uh, riders. Yeah. And I've taken a micro, uh, microscope to, the, uh, to that picture and there is a, you need a magnifying glass to find, find the green stripe right next to the red stripe. It is that minute, the number of people are going across the bridge on uh, transit. Let, let me tell you that the numbers we show Cross Lake match our previous look at the Sound Transit documents when they were proposing Sound Transit 3. And we were shocked by how few in their numbers, uh, how few transit riders there were across Lake. And in fact, the few that were on the proposed light rail across I on the I-90 corridor came out of the bus and HOV numbers, not out of the, the private automobile numbers. So even though on that map, which I can't find a way to go backwards here today. And there's a little arrows down the bottom left. Uh, won't that do that for you? Oh, thanks. You're right. That one. Yeah. So if, if like Kemper said, if you if you magnify in here, there are a few 
cross lake. But my point is it's consistent with what we saw years before with Sound Transit's planning documents. They didn't show much across lake. The other thing that's amazing about that thing is, uh, is that there's now 750,000 people in the city of Seattle, which is where most all that green is within the city of Seattle. And now east of the lake is the east side and that's 750,000 people. So both of these have participated in the cost equally and that's, uh, and they're supposed to benefit equally in terms of the facilities and look, look who got 90% of all of the benefit of light rail and look who got 10% maybe. I mean, that, well, that's, that's, and isn't this consistent with uh, what's going on in urban areas around the world, around the nation, that that light rail systems are designed to handle the office buildings in the central core downtown uh, of all every urban city? Yes. And so, you know, that's why, uh, you know, the east side you know, gets, uh, pays a third of the metro's cost and gets to, gets half the uh, transit that we pay for because it's all focused on downtown Seattle. It never That's was a, about the east side. <laughs> <laughs> Just the only thing was about the east side was the receipt of the money. I mean, uh, the money came equal amount of 750,000 people produce about the same amount on each side of the lake for this problem. Right. Look how the good gets the benefit. So, Bill, there's a scale of, of the green width of the green line down here in the lower right corner of this map. What's that lowest number on the scale? I can't read this. Um, I don't think we can see it. <coughs> I'll have to get back to you on that. All I, right. I can't magnify it enough to, to show that. All right. Um, so how do we implement this, uh, this idea of, of, of truncating the uh, transit, the, the light rail? What, what, what's, the, what's the step to move in that direction? Well, I don't want to minimize <laughs> how unpopular that'll be with some people. Uh, what we're saying is we won't, we won't tear anything out and we won't stop anything that's under construction, but we would stop any, or ha that has a federal um, approval already, but we wouldn't go any further than that. It's gonna take probably legislative action to make that stop. According to Sound Transit studies, the, the next $65 billion that gets spent produce approximately 1% of trips. So, I mean, that is the most expensive amount of money for nothing in the history of the world. So yeah. I, we need to build that case. That's a, that's a fact that the public doesn't know right now because Sound Transit spends a million or two a month telling everybody how peachy they are. They don't bother telling everybody how inequitable they are. It's such a compelling waste of money that we hope there's going to be would be political pressure to stop it. Um, so we've got one question here that got, talks about the HOV hot lane uh, trip capacity. Uh, explain the, the difference between uh, why the HOV hot lane is uh, less than the general purpose if you convert it to a general purpose lane. What we did previously, Vic, was look at the actual measured volumes um, of existing HOV and HOT lanes and that focused primarily on I-405 and SR-167 to the south. So we used real, real actual counts and showed that HOV and HOT carried less volume than general purpose lanes. 
in the same lo general locations. So it wasn't a theoretical uh, effort on our part. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, see if I can. Uh, I'll see if I can unmute, unmute you, Will. Um, back to the view. There's Chuck Collins. Is Chuck on? Is Chuck yeah, he's on. Yeah, I, I am Vic. All right. Um, so Bill was uh, was finished his his portion and was answering a few questions. If you've got, uh, uh, are you are you going to share the screen, Chuck, or not? Well, uh, uh, no. I I, I am a uh, okay. a low right. overhead operation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And I forgot how to, I forgot how to make uh, slides years ago. So, all right, go ahead. Go ahead, Bill. Uh, Chuck, I'm finished. Uh, oh. This is this is Chuck Collins, um, a brilliant guy with some great ideas for the future. Say nicer things all the time. Thank you, uh, Bill. Would you put back up the slide you just had on? The one showing the uh, the ridership lines. No, the previous one to this. Well, this is a good this is a good spot. We'll do this one too. Uh, if you look at that twenty dollars and twenty cents uh, uh, per trip, uh, and you recognize that the reason that it's that low is that there's a lot of bus trips in there. Bill, did you talk about that? Uh, a little bit. If you're, yeah. if you're do one, just if you're do a slide just on rail, um, that figure would be at least fifty bucks per trip. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and it's 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 when you're when it's costing you fifty dollars a trip, when it's costing nobody's putting in a fifty dollar fare to to ride try to train. Uh, so when the you're putting a $3 fare to ride a train, somebody else is paying $47 or $57, or in some of the future cases, more than that. And those somebodies are, are taxpayers. And if you try to solve a real big problem with that expensive, uh, with that costly a, a trip cost, you can't do very much. You just can't, there isn't enough money. So if you, Bill, if you would come back to the previous slide, one showing uh, uh, the east side and west side of, yeah, that one. Um, there, there's a real good definition of, of the problem. And I'm sure Bill explained this at some length, but you just have to focus in on that. And this is, this is that build out of, of link light rail. This is what you got. Um, and I, I live on Mercer Island. I get a big kick of people are going to tell about this wonderful service that we've got coming across the island. Uh, and, that, and if you look at that line, I guess there's some green there on the bridge, but yes. it's, it's, it's almost detectable. So anyway, I've, I, I, if those who don't know, I used to run Metro Transit, and uh, and I re I ran it in the early days, and I began to see the limitations of the system, and the biggest limitation I could see is that we were focused on mainly downtown Seattle, we were focused on to some degree the University of Washington and. And uh, to a little bit, the Boeing, the Duwamish Boeing plants, and it was clear to me that we we're running out of market. That we 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 were there weren't a lot of gets to get. Uh, uh, our modal split was was high, coming into downtown Seattle, and uh, there wasn't a lot more there. And 
a, a phenomenon was going on that I be, that a consultant first told me about. And he said, do you realize the jobs are suburbanizing? And if that goes on, you're gonna have a market you can't serve. And jobs have decentralized. They have decentralized massively. So now we've got, we've always had in this area decentralized residences, people living all over the place. But what has evolved is jobs all over the place. And it's hard to serve with transit people who live all over the place. But when you try to serve as people all over the place and jobs all over the place, you end up with an impossible proposition. So as, as the jobs decentralize, the size of the box needs to shrink because your, your opportunities to get people going from point A to point B or point Y to point Z are very limited. And we've gone in the opposite direction. The jobs are decentralized and we've increasingly centralized the system. Uh, and then, and that is the problem with link light rail. I often compare the origins and destinations to looking at a, a box of pickup sticks that have been spilled. If you, if, you, if, you, if you look at the origins and destinations, they're just all over the place. And that's not a transit opportunity. It's just as much as you'd like it to be, it's not. Unless you're prepared to centralize all those jobs uh, back in somehow to South Lake Union or whatever, uh, and that isn't what's happening. Uh, you, you don't have something that rail can serve. And at 50 bucks a trip, you can't afford to serve it. So several years ago, as autonomous cars began to emerge, I, I did a little, in, and I got tired of sitting in traffic too. I, I, it just, I was, to, was on my way to a meeting uh, near South Lake Union one day and I'd left what I thought was way more than enough time. And at the time the meeting started, I was stuck in traffic just trying to get off of I-90 on I-5. And I said, there's gotta be a better way. So if we wanted to, if we wanted to solve the congestion problem, which is not entirely, but mostly commuter driven, uh, we'd have to target the actual cause of the problem. And the cause of the problem in, is people getting to work. Um, every morning, about a million people climb in their cars and head for a school or a, uh, or a work destination in King County. And, and I thought, what do we have to do to capture half of those? What would it take? if somehow we had these autonomous cars that we're dreaming of, if they could be dispatched and controlled like Uber, if they were driverless, what would it cost? Uh, what kind of a fare would we have to charge? And uh, uh, there's an amazing amount of data around on this proposition. And, and the, the cost is, well, the, the if you charged a $2 fare and you assume that those people uh, were going on 11 mile trips, that you assume that in one case three and in one case four people were actually in each one, uh, uh, and a company owned that, uh, there would be about a 60% gross margin if you charged a $2 fare. Not a $50 fare, not a $60 fare, a $2 fare one that's actually cheaper than uh, most of public transit now. Um, Kemper and Bill asked me to look at Microsoft uh, last fall. And what, one of the secrets of serving pickup sticks is when you get to the end of one pickup stick uh, and deliver the passengers to the end of that pickup stick, you have a terrific opportunity to go to another pickup stick nearby and take people in the opposite or a different direction. But when we looked at, we looked at Microsoft, um, we, uh, 
we started was okay. We want to we want to service twenty thousand of their their uh, their their Redmond employees uh, with this service. Uh, we thought at the time that that was about half their employees. Uh, I think we learned that it's it's less than half, but it's a big number, twenty thousand. Uh, and this is going to be an inefficient system because when you deliver Microsoft employees to their homes at the end of the day. There are not a lot of people who want to go from those neighborhoods back to Microsoft at that point. So we have an, a system that is inherently dead end one way, or it's, it's excuse me, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's empty. There's nobody in it. So half of your miles, half of all the miles you drive are, are empty. And that's, that's inefficient. Uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's unfortunate, uh, but if you're just going to service Microsoft or Microsoft wants to do this for themselves, that's probably what you have to deal with. What would it take, how many of these autonomous ve driverless vehicles would it take to service 20,000 employees a day? That's, that's you know, 40,000 40, trips, uh, eliminate 40,000 trips. And the cost, even though this system is really inefficient, the cost is $1.54 per trip. That's direct costs. That's, that doesn't include overhead. That doesn't include developing the software. It doesn't, it includes buying the cars, but it doesn't include developing the parking lots for them and the staging areas and all the, re and all the rest of that. It services the cars. Uh, it, it takes care of all the direct costs, but you can do it for $1.54, even though it is, it's not efficient. Uh, it's, uh, but you, it, help, it takes 1,500 cars to do that. Um, uh, and you do it at a fraction. I mean, a, really a fraction. We're, we're talking three or 4% of what it would cost to do that with rail. Um, now, to me, when you've got something you can do for a buck and the alternative is 50 bucks, some, the decision makers ought to be paying attention. And I have, I have flogged these cost differentials to members of the Sound Transit Board on and off for 20 years. And I've only met one or two that even thought it was an interesting question. The fact so, that- So Chuck, uh I remember uh, back when you uh, had created uh, Metro's uh, van pool program, made it the most successful van pool program in the nation. Uh, and you did a little analysis and said that, you know, the market, if you think about it from a suburban point of view, is about 10 times what the best van pool system in the nation was at that time. Is that still, first, is that still true? And second, uh, what, were the, what were the obstacles? for doing that, and are those obstacles still in place? Uh, first, Vic, uh, I fought the van pools. Uh, Kemper often gives me credit for them, but I just viewed them as competitors. I, I didn't want them taking away my passengers, and Vic, I knew they would. <laughs> I did everything I could to keep them uh, uh, at arm's length. Uh, the there have been studies done by the state that show a market for van pools that is multiples of what they're actually carrying. King County is making, has no interest in expanding the program. The transit union strongly opposes it. And uh, the van pool program is, is successful. By national comparisons, it's big. But that's only because their transit unions are ultimately are vehemently opposed. Also, um, the uh, the van pool program should be five, six times the size that it is. Uh, the county has no interest in that uh, at all. And, and I, I, the last contact I had with them was probably two years ago, and they didn't. They didn't. Even the director of the program had no interest in expanding the program. So, so it's just a political uh, 
direction. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's an orphan, Vic. Um, uh, part of it is that the sound transit is sucking the money and the oxygen out of the area. Uh, there's just not much left over. Uh, uh, but Do you anyway, still think it's it, one of the best van pool systems in the nation. Oh, I, yeah, I, it is. It's, I, I think it, three years ago, it was still the biggest, uh, but it's the biggest, but it's, it's, it's small. It's, it's still an orphan. It's, it's an orphan. And, and all the van pool programs around the country are experiencing the same thing. Uh, it, uh, so you know, how, did, how, how is this shared concept of ACES, uh, when you get into shared ability for Lyft and Uber to, to, uh, to share rides, uh, how is that going to impact? <laughs> I, it, well, it's, it's going to be opposed. Uh, and in the, the question is, is if, if the Microsoft and the Amazons and the Boeings really get focused on this uh can they can they prevail against the the the, the union uh and uh, i think the answer is yes but for all the criticism i just made of microsoft that system being inefficient there's no legal barrier to microsoft doing that there's no le there's no legal barrier to amazon doing it and even though by my definition, it's inefficient, it is profoundly less expensive than what's going on now. So if, if Amazon is doing it and Microsoft is doing it and whatever left of Boeing is still doing it, Vic, that'll create the pressure. That'll really create the pressure uh, to, uh, to end these crazy monopoly rules that, that, I had to that I had a hand in creating, by the way. Um, yeah, I'll confess all my sins if, uh, if this meeting goes on longer. <laughs> there, there, there may be a barrier to, for example, Microsoft and Amazon working together. Yes, there is. Yeah, if you wanted to make that system efficient, it'd be open to to uh, Amazon employees working in Bellevue or working in Seattle and Microsoft employees. Uh, working in Redmond, that system could 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 hum. But uh, what's uh, the barrier? Is that a, is that a state law? It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a state law. And what what does it take to change state law? Uh, political pressure, um, and uh, and the pressure isn't going to come from governments uh, trying to create a more efficient system. King County and Seattle are not going down to Olympia in demand that the, uh, the monopoly for transit uh, be ended. I mean, that's, okay. they, 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 what's in the next 10, 15 years, we're gonna start to have enormous stranded assets. I mean, we're talking 20, 30, 40, 50 billion dollar assets that are stranded. What do you mean by stranded? They're, they're, they're not gonna have a market. They're gonna exist. And they're not going to be people on them. You mean you're you're talking about buses and, and trains? Yes. Uh, uh, now, will the the rail connection between between Ballard and downtown Seattle hold up? It probably will. But the rail connection between Issaquah and Seattle, I, I just I don't believe it. Uh, uh, there, you're going to be asked, let, let's just take the current economic, in economics. Uh, if, I, if I charge you for an autonomous uh, taxi pool, that's, that's, that's what I call this thing. If I charge you, you can get a fare for three bucks. You don't ride with 40 other people. You don't have to go around the route while the bus is collecting 40 people or the train is collecting people. The, the thing delivers you not five blocks from where you work or four blocks from where you work, it delivers you to where you work, you're gonna pay three bucks for a train ride that's gonna require you to transfer to a bus, uh, a, a trip that takes 40 minutes when the autonomous vehicle will take you this, for the same fare 
directly to where you're going in half that time. Pick. <laughs> it, 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 it's not going to work. It's yeah. not going to work. They are, and I, and I don't doubt, despite Kemper's heroic, uh, and I think the one guy that I've said for 20 years who gets this is Kemper. And Kemper doesn't pay me any money. I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that. <laughs> right. Well, we're going to lose Kemper here pretty soon. So, uh, Chuck, if, if you and Bill can hang around a little bit, sure. uh, uh, I'd like to have Kemper. Uh, Kemper's got a good story about how it took uh, 30 or 40 years to get 10 million square feet of uh, commercial space in downtown Bellevue and what's going to happen in the next uh, decade. Maybe you could talk about that just a little bit. It, we're, we're in the most amazing uh, boom real estate market uh, maybe anywhere in America. It's uh, unbelievable. Bellevue has, uh, in downtown, it took 40 years to build 10 million square feet of of Class A office space in downtown Bellevue, and we're now adding about maybe as much as 14 million in the next 10 years. And um, Amazon is nine buildings, including the largest building ever. Uh, so they're the largest of all of those. Microsoft is doubling the size of their campus over a 10 year period. Uh, T-Mobile has, uh, has merged with Sprint and they have 38,000 employees. They won't all be coming here. They have other places, but some significant amount uh, is likely to be coming to Bellevue, which right now has 5,000 employees. So they're becoming one of the biggest in the business and headquartered here in Bellevue. And, and there's a long list of who's who uh, filling, filling in all around it. And I'm gonna go back to Chuck's comments on what he was saying, because I've, I've heard him give a couple of points that he didn't make this morning, but he said, this, this idea that he has, has the capacity of, of moving 500,000 people a day this way for a buck and a half a piece, not 20, 30, 40, 50 dollars a piece to subsidy, but for, for a fraction of the cost. And, it, and as he mentioned, it picks you up from where you are and takes you to where you're going. And all San Transit can talk about is uh, what are they going to do about the first mile and the last mile? because it doesn't by nature start where you are or take you to where you're going. It just takes you from one station to another and it's up to you to figure out how to get to the, to where your destination is. And the, the thing that everyone that ever has taken any topics in transportation knows that if you require a guest to transfer from one mode to another on a given trip, 50% of the people won't do it. They said, I'm, I'm not gonna get all tangled up between two transit things of two different modes. And, and, uh, and, and so it, it makes it really hard for light rail to be a, com compositor, uh, a competitor. So 500,000 trips a day, and we're not forever away from self-driving cars. And when, as Chuck has done the math, when these van pools become self-driving cars, which they will in probably 10 years or less, you know, they can make uh, three or four round trips in the morning and three or four round trips in the afternoon or in the evening to take you home. And they can, they can, uh, they can continue to operate throughout the day as Uber or Lyft, uh, doing all kinds of different things. So uh, they don't have to just park them somewhere. They become part of the transportation system. And, you know, this, this is going to save the public uh, billions and billions of dollars of ineffective, inefficient, transportation and get the, get some logic going back in the system and, and get us out from under this congestion cloud that we're living with and a bunch of bureaucrats that don't want to talk about any solution. And I, I'm getting sick of it. And uh, the public is getting sick of it. So it's, I think that, and, and, and Sound Transit loves to say, well, whenever they put a multi-million dollar thing in front of us, which they do every 20 minutes, uh, they, they say it's this, maybe this isn't the best plan, but it's the only plan. Well, I'll, I guarantee you, they're gonna, people, the public's gonna hear about this plan and they're gonna, get it, they're gonna get a chance to see what we could be doing for a fraction of the assets that would really make a difference in people's lives. You know, so but, what kind of reaction are you getting out of the large employers like uh, Microsoft? Uh, we're, we're, we're going by one, one by one through all of those and getting a, fa a fabulous response. I mean, they, they, they are sick of it too. I, I, don't, I may not have these numbers perfectly, but uh, Microsoft uh, took on a fleet of uh, vehicles, some Priuses and some small vans and some full-size buses 
And the last I heard, they spent about $40 million a year uh, on that system. And they got into it primarily as a competitive thing. They thought they were going to do something to help their employees. They're, they're, all of these companies are struggling in a fight for who gets the best employees. So they sort of, everything I heard, it was the, that whole system was primarily a gift to their employees to show that they, they got something special if they came to work for Microsoft. Well, they've had enough fun trying to, I mean, you do the math. So I think about 6% of the writers are using that system. And this is a system that 20% uh, or more of the writers could use, maybe maybe a lot more than that. And it and it's, it's practically free by comparison of any other idea to the public and to the user, whoever pays. It's a fraction of the cost. So I think, I think Chuck is really onto something. And I think all of the things that are gonna be happening for free, uh, we're about to, to a big piece of what's gonna solve this uh, congestion problem is simply the advent of ADAS ideas, which two to three a year are, are, are coming for free uh, from, to the government and to the public. And uh, that, 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 that's a huge thing that our, our public transportation people aren't even thinking about. So it's so, uh, so one of the things that we could do is, is is kind of articulate how you look into that. How where are we on ADAS in terms of the global mode share, and and uh, how fast is that coming along? Uh, and is there is there anything that we can do to promote it? It it starts right away and it gets better every day. As, as more as the percentage of cars have these features, uh, it gets better by the day. The, the, the features are very inexpensive. Uh, when, when it gets, uh, we, we started to do studies of what is it when ADAS is 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50, 60, 70, and eventually up to uh, 80% or more. And uh, by the time it gets to 80%, self-driving cars that can, uh, first of it, reduce the cost of drivers for systems. It is 62% of the cost of a hired driver. Uh, these things can be very efficient and those vehicles can be used from point A to point B transportation throughout the day. It's, it's an absolute game changer. And these can be uh, electric cars, they can be natural gas powered cars, they can be all, all, all different kinds of vehicles. Uh, and compared to what we're spending now, we can, it's a fraction of the budget we're spending on things that cost a lot and do very little. And that's, that's what we have now. And sooner or later, the, the people who are trying to stand up for the existing plan are, are gonna get run out of town because it's very expensive and does next to nothing. You know, I think the PSRC's dream at the end of spending another 60 to $90 billion on, on light rail is that uh, at some point light rail is uh, is just one one and a half percent of daily trips? Well, trips between now and then are growing at two percent a year. So twenty years from now, it's forty percent increase in in trips, and uh, and 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 they're producing one and a half percent, and the buses grow to about three and a half percent. So, that's so you ha you you have uh, you know you, you're well known of course as Bellevue Square, but you also have a whole bunch of other stuff there in the Bellevue collection. Uh, how is your tenant load holding up, and do you expect those people to be uh, coming back into their office? We we have the three best office buildings in the market on the east side. Uh, they're all 100% leased, and we have called every single tenant, and every single tenant is coming back. And in fact, uh, they, several of the tenants have had double digit growth in their sales. They, they're, they're, they're incredible uh, companies that are on the east side now. So they're coming back and we, we had to scramble around to find three or four uh, additional floors for people because they're coming back needing more space, not less space. So all you read about every day in the Wall Street Journal and in the media is how nobody's coming back to an office building. It's simply not true. It, the office building is a very productive place, and if we can if we can help by getting this transportation working, which it should have been, the, the government starts with an idea and just runs with it. They don't they don't bother looking to see what's the most efficient. They they could have just as well done a study then come to all the same conclusions we did. They, they, I don't I I'm not aware of any. The government tends to start with 
they decide what the problem is and just chase it. They don't do research to find out what the problem is or what the solutions are. And that's everything. I wouldn't have a company if I ran it the way they ran their self. They're, they're completely disconnected from reality. It's a, it, they spin around in their own dish and make up their own facts. And uh, they've got, anyway, it's... All right. Well, uh, I'm aware that uh, you've got, an, you've got something coming up uh, in, in now 24 minutes. Uh, <laughs> it's it's my company's uh, annual meeting that I've got I've got about a five minute walk to get over to and and uh, so it's it's something I can't be late for, but <laughs> but I, I really appreciate all of you. I, I see recognize many of the names that are here. Many of like John Niles and and others have been helpful to to get us put together. Steve Marshall and uh, several. I, I always get in trouble if I start naming names because there's so many of you that have been helpful with this whole project. But uh, if anybody says, uh, is there anything we could do? There is a lot we could do, and it can be done very efficiently by any comparison to what we're spending now. It's a, this entire program will cost a fact fraction of what we're now spending, and we get really good results. All right. Well, thank you very much, Kemper. I appreciate it, and appreciate to your, the effort to put Mobility 21 together and, and, and to uh, put it out there. Uh, we've, we've just hit a couple of the highlights today. It's hard to do this in an hour. So one thing I'd like to say, if we can get Vic or whoever you, we, we'd be glad to send each of you a, a, a printed copy, which we can send right directly into your computer or we can send a hard copy to people. So either way. Right, uh, and we'll, we'll put that up on our website, uh, the, the ETA website. Uh, perfect. And we'd, we'd like to that. come back with the same uh, uh, crew here and, and answer answer questions after you've had a chance to read the whole report. So we've just hit a handful of highlights. There's many more things that are terrific about it, but th those are just the highlights. So if we could uh, get a copy of those studies out to you so you can read it and then uh, answer questions uh, that you may have after you've seen the whole study, because there's many other little pieces that yeah. add yeah. up. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Kemper. Thank you. Appreciate everything you guys do. It, you, we're all together working hard to make the Northwest a great place to live. And the East Side is, uh, is growing as fast as it possibly can with employers. And this, this trouble about how to get the employees to and from work is far from being solved with all the billions we're spending to, to have uh, the, the biggest expense produce just over 1% of daily trips 30 years from now. It's yeah. insane. Okay. All right. Well, thank, thank you, Kemper. I want. I do want to ask Bill Eager. Um, part of the plan is to eliminate the ETLs on 405 and other freeways, and and convert the HOB lanes. Is it all all HOB lanes, all 350 miles in the region, and convert those to PP, or just just the uh, the second lane on the 405 core? No, the plan would be to get rid of all of the express toll lanes because they're not as productive as a general purpose lane. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't make a huge difference in the result. Uh, however, uh, okay. the the real the real productive element of Mobility Twenty One is the incorporation of ADAS, um, and just to put. You know, I don't know how you'd implement this, but for example, uh, um, who's the, uh, well, Mercedes says it's about $1,800 for ADAS on, in their line and the Korean manufacturer, I'm drawing a blank. Theirs is about the same. Well. If there was a, a politically acceptable way to do it, a real bargain would be for us to just subsidize incorporation of ADAS in all the new cars. It'd be a bargain compared to what we're doing right now. Um, so that would help. Uh stimulated so, so you don't have to pay for it all you can uh, governments like to incentivize things uh, 
put some some incentive in. Yeah, because as you know, virtually every car has ADAS as an option if you want to pay for it. Well, even if you don't want to pay for it, a lot of them are there just because they're they're there. <laughs> well, like the backup camera. Yeah. yeah, like the backup camera. I got a 2016 car. It's got a backup camera and it beeps at me when I hit hit the lane line. And, and, and I think it's got the, the radar uh, front stuff. I didn't, you know, I bought that used. I didn't pay extra for it. And, you know, the European yeah. Union by, I think, 2004 is requiring the emergency braking on all cars. All right. Possible that we could do the same thing in the U.S. Um, so uh, I don't think, I, I, I am now the host and I'm trying to do my host thing and, and look for questions uh, that have uh, been put on uh, and I, and I just am having a hard time uh, seeing something that would be useful for all. Uh, Chuck, do you want to uh, give a uh, sort of a summary ending? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is an East Side advocacy group. And uh, Bill, would you mind putting up the green line chart again? Did that do it? I don't see it. Oh. No, you're not shared yet. Uncorking wine bottles is easy and fun with the rechargeable wine opener with foil cutter from Shark. Something came on. Well, let me just, uh, do you all, I, I hope you all remember it. Um, on the west side of the lake, Big, thick, lots of uh, green lines headed to downtown Seattle. I mean, just, and then an unbelievable contrast to the east side. None of those lines are as thick. There are many, many fewer. If you look at the downtown Bellevue uh, and think about all the square feet that are being added, the millions and millions and millions of square feet uh, that chart tells you, and that's a, that's a 2040 chart. That's, that's build out of the rail system and the bus. And, and that's, that's the rail trips, not the transit trips. That's the rail transit trips. Correct. Uh, is it, it, the rail trips. Uh, uh, you do not have a solution. It's as simple as that. 19 years from now at build out, you do not have a solution. If all these buses are providing first and last uh, uh, mile uh, access, it didn't work. There is no 2040 solution for the, there we go, Bill. I see it. Can everybody else see it? There we are. Yeah. You ain't got it. So this is when, when people say, well, transit's going to solve the problem. And it's because we're building light rail. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we all know that, of course, that, that Sound Transit's got a, a realignment program going on right now. Uh, they discovered this winter that they, out of their 100 billion or more program, they got an $11.5 billion hole. Yeah. And the way uh, they're, they're doing their realignment thing obviously the first thing they want to want to do is add uh, more funds and, and that's one of their major uh, options the other is to truncate or delay projects 
projects are going to be delayed on the east side is the BRT along the 405 corridor, which is not under construction, hasn't started yet. They did, they're doing design work on it, but that's going to be delayed. The Issaquah to Kirkland uh, light rail line is on the chopping block. Uh, there's a uh, uh, Sound Transit uh, Park and Ride lot over here in North uh, Sammamish that's on the books. Uh, Sound Transit 3 uh, uh, expenditure, that will be delayed. Uh, at least it's on the chopping block to be delayed. So there's a whole bunch of east side things as well as you know, the rest of the region that are on the chopping block yeah. to, uh, to 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 uh, uh, to be delayed. Uh, so it's not even going to be this good. Yeah, no, this, this assumes that the current program happens. Right. And as, and as, and as Vic, you point out, the current program in major ways isn't happening. Uh, but this is, but it, you, you, you just got to freeze this in your head. If you freeze this in your head, uh, you don't have a solution. Uh, right. So and, I'm going to ask everybody to uh, push the print screen button on your computer and go save that into a Word document and blow that thing up and keep it in your mind because that is such a dramatic picture of what light rail doesn't do for the east side. And, and Kemper mentioned that the east side population is in the very near same level as the city of Seattle population. And we have purchasing power that is just being totally not used for our purposes. The, uh, if, if you're Kemper or you work in downtown Bellevue, or you, you, or, or, or Factoria, or all these places. Uh, I, I don't, it, it, it's, you talk about congestion. We don't know what congestion is. <laughs> it's, you look at, you know, you think about 10 years from now, you, what we call congestion now is, is not what the East Side is going to experience. Um, <laughs> So that to me says that, well, the freeway is already chock-a-block, so that means more diversion onto other arterial streets uh, on the east side and yeah, try, try, the deterioration try down of a, neighborhoods. Try going down 148th yeah. nine years from now. Good luck. Yeah, uh, right, it, uh, right through here. But, but any, in any event, uh, uh, you know, I, what, 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 this group needs to get focused on this. Uh, you you well, really do, because this, so, is, this yeah. is a disaster. I've got, I've got a couple of screens that I want to share. Uh, so I'm going to take you out of that and go to my screen uh, and share that. And uh, I can get to... Um, slideshow um, this is this just kind of sets up a little bit as to what's going on uh, right now and what's going on is uh, the legislature is just about done let me see now, I went too far. I'm going too fast here. Here, legislature has got four days left. There's two transportation funding packages uh, still in play. Senator Hobbs and Senator Five got packages. Both have gas tax in them. Hobbs has got nine and a half cents. I don't know what Five's at now. But more importantly, that's about a the gas tax gets about a third of the money that they're going to raise, and the other, another third comes from some kind of a carbon fee of some sort, which, of course, drivers are going to 
pay because it's focused on transportation fuel. So, uh, and then there's a whole bunch of, there's another 15 or 20 uh, fees and, and small things that are add up to a lot of money. And it, this is a 12 to 16 year program. It's $15 billion or so and almost nothing for the 405 corridor is included in the gas tax portion. They, they do have the, uh, the 520 Northeast uh, 24th half diamond interchange in there and they've got the transit uh, access at North 8th and Renton included in that, but there's no capacity thing on 405 in these packages. They do both have some culvert money and some preservation and maintenance dollars, which of course uh, we know that the roads are just falling apart. And there's a good possibility that something might get enacted this year, but the East Side delegation uh, has not been successful in getting any of the significant $13 billion worth of unfunded projects on the 405 master plan that are included in the PSRC's 2040 plan that failed plan, uh, but they're all assumed to be in there and there's no money for them in this package. And after 16 years from 2021, we're gonna be out close to 2040. Uh, not sure how this is gonna work. Now, so that's at the legislature, at the, at the Sound Transit, they're doing a realignment. We talked about this, they got a big hole. They're gonna be making decisions this fall, this summer. Uh, and their options are basically to find new dollars or to cut or delay projects. And on the east side, the dropping block, you know, we got Stride on 405, we got Issaquah to Kirkland Light Rail, we got the park and ride lot. The point is that we need to be paying attention to the idea that Sound Transit is going through a major deal and we're on the chopping block and we've got a problem. The third thing I wanted to look at just a little bit is the city of city, city of Bellevue uh, just completed earlier this month, uh, April 5th, uh, the city council uh, reviewed the South Downtown uh, Access Study. They selected an option of the Lake Hills Connector on ramp with an auxiliary lane down to I-90. <clears throat> and that's about a $125 million little interchange project, which is totally unfunded and the legislature's not even thinking about it. So it's just one more thing that's on the list of unfunded accesses to 405 that we can add. It's always been in the master plan. It's always been a, another interchange in the master plan. Now we've got a plan on how to do it. It's still unfunded and has no schedule whatsoever. City's also going through uh, their uh, biannual effort of creating a, a capital investment program. It's a seven year CIP is how, how the city's gonna focus uh, their money in, in the next seven years. Uh, and of course the current political structure is that there's gonna be a significant emphasis on the, the, the bicycle pedestrian access. And there's always some capacity stuff in there and there's a whole lot of maintenance and preservation, but there's a real focus on the ped bike portion. Uh, I put this out when I was on the transportation commission, we did this, this downtown transportation plan update. I see I misspelled downtown on this slide a long time ago, but we were looking at 2010 to 2030, same kind of thing, huge growth, uh, getting up to 665,000 daily trips by 2030. Most of the growth is in the green part, which is which is people in cars. There's quite a lot of growth in the pedestrians, people walking. But here's here's the, 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 you can't see it, but there's a yellow line between the black and the blue. Those are the bikes. The blues are pe people on buses. The and, and this orange is the people that expected to be on 405 BRT. And and the red is 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 how how Link Light Rail is projected supporters. So you can see, uh, it's hard to see that, so I blew it up a little bit. Uh, and, and this is the same chart only with a blow up of the top part. And here's the numbers on it, I'll put those up. But the next one just blows up the top part here, shows that, you know, 0.2% of the trips 
are bikes. 11% are walking, 80% are cars, same stuff that, that Bill was showing you. But this is specific to, to uh, downtown Bellevue. That's a good chart, Vic. And it just doesn't show um, uh, that these things are going to do any good at all. I got the same kind of data for citywide. This is the same chart, only it's citywide instead of downtown. Same kind of thing, only it, the scale is different. We're now up to a million and three quarter trips and a half a million new trips. Uh, and the bulk of them uh, being in, in, in cars. Uh, and uh, go through the same explosion kind of thing. And I, I got one more I want to show you. And this, this is the, the city does a, every two or three years, it does a 12 year projection. It's called the transportation facilities plan. And this is the map of the city of Bellevue in 2030. This is the 2019 to 2030 TFP transportation facilities plan. Uh, city has system intersections in 2030 under the current planning. 37 of the critical intersections around the city is a red dot. Here's 148th. Chuck talked about trying to go down 148th. What's it going to look like? Well, it's going to look like a hell of a lot of red dots, <laughs> which means the overcapacity and hard to get there. Uh, the city has a, uh, a, a currency system that sets up 14 different districts around the city. That's what these little numbers are, 14, 11, 7, 1. Three of the 14 districts in, in 2030 fail the city's level of service standards under what we're doing. Uh, and it, it, just one more time, one more thing that says we have a plan that's designed to fail. What are we focused on? We're focused on bikes. Here's the map of the bike. Uh, well, we were on the, uh, I was on the uh, Transportation Commission. Uh, we talked about bikes, 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 bikes. And they kept asking the staff, well, how many bikes did we have? And, and they said, well, uh, well, they created these 14 locations around the city in, in 2019 and actually started counting bikes in the summer of 2019 through the winter and into uh, the spring of, of 2020. So we have, so everything here, these bike numbers are all pre-COVID bike trips on an average weekday, WDT uh, is average weekday traffic. The bikes, for instance, on Northeast 12th, at, 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 before you cross the freeway, there were 32 bikes on that, on that expensive bike lane. Uh, in, in, in that summer, when there were 19,000 cars uh, on that street. Now, uh, people who know downtown Bellevue, there's a project going on right here to, there's a multi-million dollar, I don't, I didn't get the number, uh, project of, of upgrading the bike lane through the park on the north side of 12th uh, to enhance this east-west bike lane uh, at this location, 32 bikes use that street in, in, in 2019. And you look around, here's, here's, here's the 520 trail. These are the bikes coming across the lake. You know, we spent $4 billion uh, replacing the Lake Washington 520 bridge with seven lanes on it. One of the seven lanes was for bikes. The other six lanes are for cars. On that, on that corridor, 190 bikes using their lane and 147,000 vehicles using their lanes. You go down to I-90, that's this one down here. This is the I-90 trail. It was way up to 444 bikes coming across Lake Washington and, and ending up in Bellevue on the I-90 I trail where there's 181,000 vehicles on that freeway right there. So the, the correlation between the bikes and the vehicles is, is my point here. And you add up all these top lines, all these bikes uh, all the way around here and you get 1400 bikes a day. Well, um, that's where I get to 0.2%. <laughs> 
there aren't very many bikes. Uh, this is the city's way of, 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 of looking at the same data. These are the 14 locations. Uh, the multiple lines here is uh, September, October, November, December, and you can see that there's a variable by, by, by time of year, but it's all consistent. The biggest number out here is 190. That's the 191 there. Uh, so the point is, we've been presented today with Mobility 21, a thing for the region, and I'm going to stop the share now. And and we've been fighting at ETA, you know, all these things for years. Uh, seemingly, we're getting nowhere, and so what we're wanting to do is, okay, how do we make a difference? What's next to, to really make a difference? I see it's 9.32, so I overstayed my time. Thank you, Bill Eager and Chuck Collins for, for, for being here, participating, and um, shedding some light on transportation for the region. Appreciate Thanks for giving us, giving us the opportunity. Thanks, Vic. And I just want to shout out to Colonel. Uh, I will. Go. I see Steve Marshall there. Uh, Steve and I are probably only five miles apart right now. But uh, um, you could you could ask Steve to hold forth on bikes. He'd, he'd, he'd go all morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, good to be with all of you. Thank you. Goodbye now. All right. Thanks. Um, so with that. Um, I guess it's uh, end of the end, end of the time. I will I will end the meeting. Thank you very much for participating. Appreciate it. See you next month. Okay. Goodbye.